As we think about creating new rules for integration, we think back to rules for differentiation. Because remember, we have the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says differentiation and integration are kind of like two sides of a coin. They're connected to one another. So if we have a rule for differentiation, we can translate it into a rule for integration. Now, one example is the chain rule. That's a rule for differentiation. When we translated it into integration, it became substitution, a wonderfully fantastic rule. Another example is the fact that when we take derivatives, we can break up over addition and say the derivative of a sum of two things is the sum of the derivatives of those two things. All right, so what's another important rule? Well, kind of the last big important rule is the product rule. And so we're going to say, okay, let's take the product rule, a rule for differentiation, and ask the question, what does it become when we talk about integration? And I think we'll see that it's going to become parts of our toolbox, and a very important tool to, for, for us to use. So let's look at it. So here we go. We're starting with our product rule, which says the derivative of a product, so I have two functions multiplying. So f times g, that's f prime g, f g prime. Okay, yeah, we know that. So what do we do? Well, now I'll take the antiderivative of both sides. And we come to the conclusion that says, look, f of x, g of x, so that's the antiderivative of the derivative, is the antiderivative of f prime times g plus the antiderivative of f g prime. Of course, there's some constants floating around, but constants work themselves out. Now, our last thing to do is say, hey, let's just move this across. So we get the integral of, of a function times its derivative, or in other words, f g prime is the function times f of x times function g of x minus the integral f prime of x times g of x. Okay, great. Now, normally when you see this in notation, I say, look, to keep track, we'll say, we'll introduce variables. We'll, we'll call u f of x, we'll call v g of x. So we'll think of g prime of x dx, that's our dv, f prime of x dx, that's our du. So oftentimes it's written as u dv is uv minus integral v du. And you say, look, that's for, you know, antiderivatives, indefinite integrals. What about definite integrals? Same principles apply. So if I want to know the integral from a to b of u dv, that's uv evaluated from a to b minus integral a to b v du. Great, wonderful. Now, is it useful? That's actually an important question to ask because sure, you can do a lot of things, but is it advantageous? Is it going to help us get closer to an answer? Because what is it we're really doing here? In essence, if you think about what's happening, we're saying, well, I have a function times a derivative of something, and then what I'm doing is I'm sort of swapping, saying, saying well, I have a function and a derivative, and I'm trying to integrate that. I want to swap and say, okay, I'm going to replace the function with its derivative, replace the derivative with the function. And sometimes, lo and behold, what can happen is that the integral simplifies. So somehow, oftentimes it happens in the art of taking the derivative of a piece, something simplifies. So we're going to see this more in our practice, but the answer to the question is, is this useful, is, is yes. It's useful in many, many situations. So what is this called? This is called integration by parts. So we say, great. And why integration by parts? Well, we really think about, look, there's two pieces. There's our f and our g prime, and we're changing integral f to g prime to integral of f prime g with the goal to make things simpler. Really, remember, that's how integration works. Can we integrate it? And if the answer is yes, we do it. If the answer is no, we say, okay, what can we do to simplify our expression? And of course, the wonderful answer is there are so many things. So it's a good, it comes down to practice. Practice, how do we know? How do we identify what's the right kind of simplification? 
So let's think about it. So recall our basic rule. We have our integral of u dv is uv minus the integral v du. So whenever we're thinking about doing integration by parts, we have to say, look, there's two parts involved. So that is, there's some part which is u, and there's some part which is dv. In other words, looking ahead, the u, we're going to take a derivative of, the dv, we're going to integrate. So, how do we choose them? Now, some people have long lists and acronyms. I think it's easier just to sort of say, let's think about what properties we want to be true. What makes something a good choice for you? Well, because it's something that uh, we differentiate, well, it probably should be something which has a nice derivative. So we're looking for things with nice derivatives. Uh, also, we can say, you know, how do we look for it? Well, since we know it's the part that we're not integrating, maybe we should say if it's a hard part to integrate, then that's a good candidate. So in general, if something's hard to integrate, easy to differentiate, that's a great choice for our U. Um, the other thing to look for is if you have polynomials. You see like x squared, x to the fifth, whatever you like. Why? Well, if we think about differentiation, the power goes down. And every time we apply differentiation, the power drops and drops and drops and drops. So if you start with x to a positive whole number, and you differentiate often enough, you'll eventually get down to x to the zero, which is one, and it's gone. All right, the dv. Well, look, you got to integrate that piece. So you say, oh, is there some piece some small part of my current statement, which is easy for me to integrate. And if there is, that's a good candidate. Now, one thing that sometimes you might not think about doing is you might say, hey, integration by parts involves integration where there's two pieces in there. So you might say, I have to integrate the following. Let's just, just suppose, we won't do it right now. Let's suppose you were asked to integrate arctangent of x dx. And we ask the question, could you do this by parts? The answer feels like no, because you say, look, if I'm doing it by parts, there has to be two things multiplying. There's only one term here. We're in trouble. But here's the cool thing. It turns out that another way to think of arctangent is arctangent times 1. So there's sort of a hidden 1 here. Now, what would happen? We say this arctangent piece is one piece, this one is the other piece. And now we say, okay, we have to integrate one and we have to differentiate one. Well, if we knew how to integrate arctangent, we'd be done. So this part has to be the part that we differentiate, which makes it u. So that means that the one could be our dv, and off we go. And we can make progress. So, that's what we mean when 1 dx might be an option. So look for things which are easy to integrate. Also look for things where it doesn't really matter whether you integrate or differentiate. It stays the same. So things like e to the x, sine of x, cosine of x. If you integrate or differentiate those, you essentially get back to what you started with. So they're fairly stable. So you can say, well, I'll, I'll make those be the parts I integrate. And uh, then I'll work with the other part. Now there's a great rule of thumb, and it says, if you don't know what to do, try something. And one of two things happens. Either it's great, or it's not. So if it works, wonderful. And if it doesn't work, try the other thing. And that's great, you know, because there's really more or less just two options. And so there you go. And it's not so bad. Generally speaking, I think the thing that'll probably get you most of the way there is just think about, if I'm doing integration by parts, I can't integrate the whole thing, but there's a part of it that's really easy to integrate, and that will be my dv, and the rest of it I can differentiate because we're great at differentiation. So just think about, what can I integrate? That's not so bad. All right, well, a couple of notes. Now, 
Integration by Parts, it's a wonderful tool and it's exciting. It's like, woo, we've got some shiny new tool. And oftentimes when we get a shiny new tool, we're just like, okay, you do integration by parts in this problem and you do integration by parts in that problem. Every problem becomes integration by parts. But not every problem should be integration by parts. So, so slow down. Just remember, it's one tool among many. And in some sense, I don't want to say integration by parts is a tool of last resort, but you should always be looking first for things like substitution, simplifications with trig identities and algebra. So make sure you combine it with all of the tools that you have already at your disposal. Now, another thing that might happen is we might have to do integration by parts multiple times. And that's perfectly fine. You can imagine I have something like an x squared, where if I do integration by parts once, it gets down to x. And if I do integration by parts again, it gets down to 1. And I'm like, wow, great, perfect. So, and of course, that's just one case. You could imagine x to the 100. OK, integration by parts 100 times. Yeah, you can do it. Sure, in theory, practice, probably not that exciting. So one of the things to be careful of is when you do integration by parts multiple times, there is a minus sign involved. And so you have to be careful. So I, I want to uh, talk about sort of two things that come together. And then we'll do a little example of something here on the end. So in other words, when you're doing integration by parts multiple times, our formula says integral of u dv is uv minus the integral of v du. So if you were to repeat integration by parts again, you say, OK, now, da 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 and you get something on the end, just remember that that minus has to distribute to the whole thing. So when in doubt, use parentheses. Parentheses help you save points because you'll get those minuses distributing correctly. You can always go at the end and say, let me check my answer. Let me see if when I take the derivative at the end, I get back to where I needed to start with. So just a word of warning, I will say that one of the most common mistakes made in integration by parts is that minus sign and we're getting to distribute it through when you do repeated integration by parts. So be careful. Another fun thing that can happen, and, and this is really, I do think this is amazing and that it works so well, is sometimes when you do integration by parts a couple of times, you'll get to a place where you say, whoa, wait a second, I've done integration by parts twice, but it matches almost what I started with. And what does that mean? Well, two things could have happened. One thing is, you did integration by parts sort of wrong in the sense of the, of the following. Okay. When you do integration by parts multiple times, you have to commit. So this is, I don't know a better way to, to say this, but uh, we'll just call it be consistent in how you commit. And so for instance, you might say, well, maybe I have one part is, say, e to the x, another part is sine of x, and you do integration by parts, and you're going to get to some integral that involves e to the x and cosine of x. So, so let's suppose you chose u as e to the x, v as your sine of x, and you come down here, you get your, your du as e to the x, and your v is, and then you get cosine x, cosine, don't worry about the sine, okay. But the point is, if you were to repeat it a second time, you want to be consistent. So the thing that you integrated before, you still want to keep integrating. The thing that you differentiated before, you still want to keep differentiating. Because if you say, oh, well, let me switch my mind, haha, -ha, then you're, you're going to not be in a good place. Why? Well, what happens if you're not careful is you can do the following. You can say, look, the integral of u dv is, according to this rule, uv minus the integral of v du. And now you could say, look, I started by differentiating the du and I integrated the dv. Well, now I'll, I'll change my mind. 
Now I'll differentiate the dV and I'll integrate the du. You say, well, okay, what would happen if you did that? Well, what would happen is you'd get the following. You get uv minus, and now when you integrate, you'll get a u and a v. And then it'll be minus the integral, the integral of du is u, the derivative of v is dv. And lo and behold, what happens? The uvs cancel, and the minus comes through, and we come to the thrilling conclusion that our integral of u dv is the integral of u dv. Aha! Which means we've made no progress. So that's why it's important to be consistent. If you do integration by parts and then say, ah, let me now swap the roles and do it again, you'll discover you've undone your progress. So make a commitment and keep it and keep working it through. So, okay, that's something that can happen. But there is one other interesting thing that can happen. Okay, what's the other interesting thing? I want to go through and do a really quick example. This will be fun. All right, integral sine theta, cosine theta, d theta. Okay, so let's call this part here u, and we'll call this part here dv. Now, you're probably saying, we know how to integrate that. I know, I know. But let's do it by parts, and let's see if we can say something interesting here. Okay, so what would our du become? The derivative of u is cosine. What's the antiderivative of cosine? Well, it's sine. So we get the following. The integral of sine theta cosine theta d theta is u times v, that's sine squared. Great. Minus integral v du. And I should have put a little d theta here. So that'd be integral of uh, sine theta cosine theta d theta. Okay. Good. Good. All right. Well, progress, right? Well, progress of a sort. Now, next step. Okay, we're going to do it again. What? Again? Yes. Yes. Now, if we go with our mantra, remember we said commit, commit. All right, well, what did we commit to? Well, the, the sine to it became cosine, so that says, hey, this cosine, that's the part that we should take a derivative of. So that'll become our u. And our sine, that becomes our dv. So then our du, well, that's negative sine theta, d theta. And what's our v? Well, we have to integrate sine. What's the integral of sine? Integral of sine is minus cosine. Okay, so what do we have? All right, we get the following. We get sine squared theta minus u times v. Well, cosine times minus cosine is minus cosine squared. And then we have minus the integral v du. So that's a minus cosine minus sine. Okay, wow. Well, let's simplify. So we have sine squared plus cosine squared. And now we go through and we keep track of all our negatives. And whoops, I, I'm missing a parenthesis. There we go. There we go. Parentheses are all back in order now. All right. So we have one, two, three, four. So plus the integral of sine theta, cosine theta, d theta. Now, what can we do? Well, look what we have. There's an integral of sine theta, cosine theta, integral of sine theta, cosine theta. So what must be true? They gotta cancel, right? Right? Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that. And when we subtract over, lo and behold, 
we come to the following conclusion that zero is equal to sine squared plus cosine squared. But wait a second. What does sine squared plus cosine squared equal? One. So by doing integration by parts, we have come to the conclusion that zero equals one. Ha <laughs> ha! Wow! Amazing! Amazing! It must be false. It can't possibly be true. But wow! <laughs> okay, so it is false. It's definitely false. I don't want you to think, oh, math was a lie. Everything I've known for the last 20 years of my life, it's no longer true. I, I did tell you a lie. Can you see where I lied to you? And it was not anything to do with integration by parts. Integration by parts was done completely correctly. It's not this behavior here. There's something else that happened. So, here's the thing. When we talk about the integral of sine theta, cosine theta, d theta, we're really talking about a particular antiderivative of that function, and this is another antiderivative of that function. Are these two antiderivatives the same? And if they're not, how are they not the same? Well, remember, Antiderivatives don't have to be unique. They differ by a constant. So it turns out that these two antiderivatives are not the exact same, but really there's an extra constant floating around, and that constant is what gives you that plus one. So, so that was not the case. So good. Whew. Faith restored. Mathematics is still true. So that's, that's the good news. Now, it feels like at this point, you're probably saying, okay, so we'll never go to the point where we integrate by parts twice and we get to where we want it and, and do combinations. But the truth is we will. We'll th look at expressions like the integral of e to the x uh, times cosine x or e to the x sine of x. If you do it twice, you'll get to something that looks similar to what you had before. But in that case, when you move it over, instead of canceling, where we put canceling in quotes, remember there's up to a constant, they'll actually will combine up to some multiple. And that will be enough for us to solve what the integral is. So we will have purposes to do integration by parts twice, or we put things together. All right, good. Well, it's a new tool with integration, and as with all tools, but very importantly with new tools, it requires practice. Practice and more practice. This is something that we're going to see coming up again and again. So you want to get comfortable using integration by parts, learning to recognize it, learning to figure out which part you integrate, which part you differentiate. So there's no better way to do that than to go do some practice problems. So hope to see you soon.